Welcome one and all to episode four of the Audio Guide to the Galaxy, a stellar podcast put together by those of us at SciTech to help you stay connected with our wonderful universe. My name is Leah, a presenter here at the SciTech Planetarium, and tonight I'm going to be taking you on a journey to the stars and back, so I hope you're ready. This recording is time to take place at 7.30pm on any night of the upcoming week, starting from Saturday the 25th of April. But, in fact, it will still be relevant for the next few weeks following. There is only one thing that I will mention towards the end that is time sensitive. Otherwise, you are free to enjoy this whenever the time and weather suits. As always, make sure that you head outside and that you have a beautiful clear night sky overhead. As it is getting cooler now, do make sure that you stay nice and warm. Over the last few weeks, we have become more familiar with some standout constellations in our night sky, from Orion to the Southern Cross and even learning about Canis Major and Minor last week. Tonight, we are going to be putting that knowledge to use as we explore the life of a star. From the early beginnings to the explosive endings, stars are amazing and we're going to see how they change over the course of their life by observing some special stars in the sky. At the end of the episode, we will finish up by paying our birthday respects to a very special spacecraft flying above us but more on that later. Are we feeling ready? Awesome, let's begin. Look up right now and find any star twinkling down at you. Doesn't have to be one you already know, just any star you can find. That star that you see, that flickering little bit of light, it doesn't look like much to our eyes, but remember that up close, that twinkling light is just like our sun. Huge, hot, and a powerful energy source. Our sun is wonderful, and it's so important for life here on Earth. But even our sun hides how complex stars can be. To a human lifetime, our star seems almost frozen in time, never really appearing to age and giving no clue as to how it was born or even how it might die. To learn about the life of a star, we need to look beyond just the sun, out into the many hundreds of thousands of stars in our galaxy. As we look out at them all, they too appear frozen in time. But the wonderful thing is that there are so many stars that they are all appearing to be frozen at different points in their life cycle. And this allows us to learn how they evolve over time from birth to death, what we call stellar evolution. So let's start at the beginning with star formation. And we'll do that by starting with the all too familiar constellation of Orion. Do you remember where it is in the sky? I want you to find it now. Remember to orientate yourself Find the direction of west and you'll spot it low in the northwestern sky. Looking at Orion, I hope you remember it as the great warrior in the sky. But I want you to focus your attention to his belt, those three bright stars in a row in the middle. If you remember back to episode one, Leon described that the three stars of Orion's belt also form part of the pattern known as the saucepan with the three stars making up the bottom of the saucepan. Now look to the three stars just to the left that make up the handle of the saucepan. Have you got them? Now if you know your astronomy or even remember something mentioned in passing a few weeks ago, you might already know that the middle star is not really a star, but another very special object known as the Orion Nebula. If you look closely, You'll see it isn't a sharp point of light like you would expect a star to be. Instead, it's more of a fuzzy speck in the sky. If you have a small telescope or even a pair of binoculars, you might be able to make out some of the faint details of the nebula. Now, the reason why it's so captivating 
is because the Orion Nebula is something known as a stellar nursery, a place in our galaxy where baby stars are being born. The Orion Nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust stretching about 24 light years across from one side to the other. To put that into perspective, the size of the Orion Nebula is over 5,000 times the distance between the Sun and Neptune. It is huge! Being so big is one of the reasons why we are able to see it with the naked eye. But it is also extremely bright as countless stars are bursting into life, their energy shining bright for all to see. The mass of this nebula is so large that it is estimated over 700 stars are being born within this region space. But how does a star form? Well, that's an excellent question. Picture this. Within the great big cloud of gas and dust, there are tiny little particles that have just that little bit of extra gravity. That extra strength in gravity causes other bits of dust and gas to gravitate towards it and join together to make an even bigger clump of material. Well, as you can imagine, that bigger clump now has even more gravity, causing more bits of material to fall towards it and join together to make an even bigger clump. This process, it keeps happening until it gets to a point where this clump of matter has so much mass and it's so big that it starts to collapse under the strength of its own gravity. The pressure of the gravity at the center of this ball of mass is so strong that it gets really hot and enough energy is created that nuclear fusion can begin. This is what powers a star, nuclear fusion, the process of two atoms joining together to form new heavier atoms. But you need extreme conditions to do this conditions that you only really find in the heart of stars. So once nuclear fusion ignites, we have the making of a brand new star. And we see many of these formations within the Orion Nebula. That process of star formation is happening over and over again within that fuzzy little speck of light in the sky. But the thing is, a star is more than a strong, powerful energy source driven by nuclear fusion. A star is actually the perfect balance between two forces. The force of gravity that is trying to collapse under its own weight is balanced by the new source of energy from nuclear fusion, which is so strong that it pushes against this collapse. Once this balance is achieved, a star moves on from the early stages of its life into the next phase, becoming what astronomers call a main sequence star. Main sequence stars are constantly fusing hydrogen into helium within their core. This is a stable process that can last for quite some time. In fact, most of a star's life will be spent as a main sequence star. And it's thanks to this fact that it makes it quite easy to find main sequence stars out there in our galaxy. In fact, you might be familiar with one the Sun. Our Sun is a classic example of a main sequence star. At 5 billion years old, it's about halfway through its life. For the past 5 billion years, it's been burning away at the center, fusing hydrogen into helium, and it will continue to do so for another 5 billion years. And this is a good thing for us. Knowing that it's a main sequence star means we can be reassured when we go to bed at night that the Sun isn't going to randomly explode at any given moment will always be there shining bright in our sky. Of course right now we can't see the Sun, but we can spot some main sequence stars in the night sky. In fact Leon pointed to one last week, the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius. Can you still spot it in the sky? Remember it's the brightest star in the western sky, just about a hand span above Orion. Sirius, or I should say Sirius A, the larger companion in this star system, is also fusing hydrogen within its core, something it has been doing for the past 250 million years. But do you remember something else mentioned about Sirius A in last week's episode? 
Remember, this star is actually twice as heavy as the sun, meaning it's fusing hydrogen at a much faster rate. And this is the reason why it's such a bright, hot star. But it also means it will use up its fuel much more quickly. So it won't be a main sequence star for as long as the sun. The sun still has another 5 billion years to go, but Sirius A only has another 750 million years before it moves on to the next stage of its life. You see, main sequence stars can come in lots of different varieties. There are really big hot ones like Sirius A, but there are also main sequence stars that are far smaller and cooler. Do you remember a star that is small and cool? I'll give you a hint, it's also really close. Our nearest neighbour, Proxima Centauri, one of the stars in the Alpha Centauri system. Turn to the south and see if you can spot it again. Remember, it is the bottom star of the pointers, the two bright stars that guide us to the Southern Cross that we discussed in episode two. Even though it is a small little star, remember it's roughly six times smaller than our sun. It is doing the exact same thing within its core, fusing hydrogen atoms into helium. Despite its small size, there is still enough pressure from gravity to help drive the process of nuclear fusion. That difference in size, however, does have some interesting consequences. While it has been burning hydrogen in its core for the past five billion years, just like the sun, it will continue to burn hydrogen for much longer than the sun. In fact, Proxima Centauri will remain a main sequence star for the next four trillion years. Yes, that's right, four trillion years. When we compare it to larger stars like Sirius A, which has to burn its fuel much faster in order to keep that perfect balance of forces, the small size of Proxima Centauri means there is less force from gravity pulling inwards, so it doesn't have to create as much energy from nuclear fusion to push outwards, keeping it a main sequence star well into the future. So out there in the galaxy you can find big main sequence stars like Sirius A and small main sequence stars like Proxima Centauri, and our sun lies somewhere in the middle. Stars can vary so much, but sooner or later, there comes a time in a star's life when their fuel does run out. And when this happens, it signals a star entering into the final stages of its life. When a star moves on to this final stage, it can go in one of two different ways. It all depends on how massive a star is. Let's take our sun for example. As we've seen, it's pretty average when it comes to stars, not too small, but also more importantly, not too big. Once our sun runs out of fuel in the core, it will start to expand as it moves on to burning any extra fuel it can find in its outer layers. It will grow so big that the Earth will be engulfed by its swell. But luckily, this is five billion years in the future, so we don't need to worry too much. During this process, the sun will start to lose its mass, causing that perfect balance to tip in the favour of nuclear fusion. The powerful force continues to push out while the force of gravity gets weaker and weaker. Eventually, it will get to a point where the sun can no longer hold itself together and it will shed all of its outer layers into space. The only thing to remain is a small, hot, dense core, a white dwarf. The white dwarf will contain roughly 50% of the sun's mass, but it will be small, only a little bigger than the Earth. That immense pressure means that the remaining core is very hot, much hotter than the outer surface of the sun ever was. But you have heard this story already, because we spotted a white dwarf in the sky last week. Do you remember? Sirius B. The smaller companion to Sirius A is also a white dwarf, and it went through the exact same process as our sun will. That little dense core though, it will continue to remain there for trillions of years. What if a star was bigger than the sun? And I mean really big. Let's say a star 40 times more massive than the sun. 
such stars have far more explosive endings. And we can see an example of a star like this in our night sky, Betelgeuse, the giant red star that makes up one of the shoulders of Orion. Navigate your way back to Orion, looking for the bright three stars of his belt. Just to the right of these stars, about two to three finger widths, you'll spot a bright red star. This is Betelgeuse, a red supergiant in the final stages of its life. This star is roughly 700 light years away and really big. It's about 900 times bigger than our sun. If it was in our solar system, it would reach out beyond Mars. The reason why it's so big is because it has finished burning hydrogen and it has started to expand, a little similar to what the sun will do. The big difference, however, is the fact that it has so much mass and able to create so much energy within the core that it's able to fuse other heavier elements. It has enough fuel to keep on burning and push against the collapse. The problem is though, there is a limit. And once it's reached, there is no more fuel to power nuclear fusion. And once again, that perfect balance is tipped. This time, however, it's tipped in the opposite direction. With no more power coming from nuclear fusion, there is nothing there to stop the star from collapsing under its own weight. When this happens, a star goes supernova, a powerful explosion that sends the star's material out into space. Betelgeuse isn't quite at the explosive stage yet, but it's really close. In fact, you may have heard about the star in the news recently. It was getting unusually faint and many were getting excited that it was about to go supernova. After further investigation, however, scientists are pretty certain that it was just some dust and gas getting in the way, making it appear fainter than normal. In reality, it still has a way to go before it explodes. All we can do is wait. When it does go supernova, however, it will shine bright as all that energy is released. In fact, it will be so bright that you might even see it shine during the day. After time though, that brightness will fade and all that will remain is a hot, dense core known as a neutron star. A core that is far smaller but much more dense than the sun's white dwarf will ever be. As I said, stars are truly amazing. And there is a lot to see in our night sky, and especially if you have a telescope. Telescopes allow us to look a little more closely at these stages of a star's life. However, to finish for this evening, I would like to give an honorable mention to a telescope that has allowed us to observe the universe and learn so much, the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning Hubble is because, just like me, the Hubble Space Telescope is celebrating a very special milestone, its 30th birthday. This spacecraft was launched on the 24th of April, 1990, just one week before I was born. For 30 years, this spacecraft has been orbiting the Earth, collecting tremendous pictures of the universe and helping to further our knowledge, from refining the age of the universe to collecting evidence that confirms the universe itself is expanding. Over the past three decades, it has done magnificent science. The telescope itself, it uses a 2.4 meter wide mirror to capture its images in low Earth orbit. It's just 540 kilometers above the Earth, where light pollution and the atmosphere are no longer a problem for observations. It did have a rocky beginning though. When it was first launched, that large mirror was just a few millimeters out of shape, which might not sound like much, but it was enough to cause images to be a little blurry. All that time and effort for things to not go quite as planned. But the wonderful thing about Hubble is that it is orbiting close enough to the Earth that we were able to send astronauts to it. And that's exactly what NASA did. They figured out what the problem was, 
designed a solution to fix it, and then sent astronauts up into space to fix the problem. And since then, we have been fortunate enough to see some truly amazing images, and I would recommend you checking them out for yourself. In fact, in honour of its birthday, NASA released a website that allows you to see what images Hubble took on your very own birthday. And you can find that link on our Facebook page. Now, Hubble's orbit doesn't bring it quite south enough for those of us in Perth to see it in the sky. But for our friends up north, you are far more fortunate. In particular, for those up in Broome on the 29th of April, there is going to be a bright flyover of Hubble at 6.51 p.m. and it'll last for about five minutes. At this time, look towards the west, where you should start to see a small bright point moving towards Orion. It will pass through Orion, head towards the southeast in the direction of Sirius before disappearing from view. I recommend checking out the sky map on the SciTech Facebook page on the 29th for more information. And anyone within neighbouring areas up north will spot some good flybys too. Keep an eye out for any sky maps posted to the SciTech Facebook page or if you want to check it out for yourself, have a look at the website Heavens Above for more information. That does bring us to the end of this episode though. Tonight we've got a bit more of an insight into stars and how they can change over the course of their life. From the beginnings we can see in the Orion Nebula to middle-aged stars like our Sun and discovering what fate beholds those stars in the future. To finish off we honoured the Hubble Space Telescope with a birthday mention. Just like me, it will be celebrating its birthday in isolation, but that doesn't mean we can't celebrate the telescope and the wonderful science it has achieved. And make sure for those of you who can, you try and catch a glimpse of it passing overhead. Just check out our Facebook page over the next week for more info. On that, I wish you all a good night, but remember, you can find the universe just outside. <laughs>